Our first presenter this morning is We You. We You is a product manager responsible for the MISA and SERS product lines at Metronome. Metrome, excuse me. We holds a PhD in biomedical engineering from the University of Maryland in College Park, Maryland. We and the team at Metrome Ramen have decades of experience in the manufacture of ramen instrumentation and development of practical applications for ramen spectroscopy and SERS. With that, I'll turn it over to Wii U. Hello everyone, I'm Wei from Metrom. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to tell you about our new exciting uh, surface enhanced ramen or SERS analyzer, the MISA. So this is the outline of my presentation. Uh, I'm gonna go over briefly about the problems that we currently face with edible oils, namely with adulteration and contamination. Uh, I will then give you a highlight of the features of the MISA testing pl platform and how it can it be applied to combat these problems. And then also show you a couple of examples of how we can use the MISA to detect some organophosphates in extra virgin olive oil. So olive oils, Extra virgin olive oil is one of the most popular edible oils uh, because of the widely promoted benefits of a Mediterranean diet. Whereas a hundred years ago, it might be just a farmer using a very crude mill to process oils from his orchard for a local market. With the increase in demand, there is increase in um, pesticide use and increasing the potential for contamination, whether it's accidental or intentional, and fraud at every stage along the, the supply chain. The same can be said for many other edible oils. Contamination of edible oils and other foods is a global problem costing billions of dollars annually. And it is especially prevalent in countries where regulations are lax or where testing capabilities are limited. So it's not only a monetary cost, but there is also a public health issue as well. So in terms of adulteration, adulteration is really a criminal act in the, with the intention to profit from the high value of the oil. If you go to the supermarket today, a bottle of uh, a liter, let's say, of generic vegetable oil will cost probably a couple of dollars. But a bottle of good olive oil is gonna cost upwards of $10 or more. Criminals take advantage of this by intentionally mislabeling the, a cheaper oil as olive oil or mix cheaper oils with virgin oils to, to add bulk. Sometimes colorings and flavorings can also be added to make the product more appealing. Contamination, on the other hand, is the introduction of foreign material during the production process. Some materials like pesticides, even though they may be re relatively uh, at low concentrations, maybe PPM levels, uh, can still be very harmful for our health. So in terms of testing approaches, testing met methodologies can be classified as targeted tests or non-targeted tests. Non-targeted tests try to determine whether a sample is different from a reference but this means that the, whatever the adulterant or contaminant present must be significant enough that it cause a difference from the reference. Targeted tests are those that aim to identify and if possible, quantify the amount of the contaminant that is present. In the current technology testing landscape, there are 
a wide variety of different instruments and techniques used depending on the parameter of interest. Most of these instruments that, that I've shown here below are fairly bulky, expensive, and are limited to a well-equipped uh, well testing lab. So this is the MISA from Metro. Metro has introduced the MISA analyzer with the goal of solving these problems by providing a highly sensitive and low cost mobile testing platform. It runs on a rechargeable battery and is the size of a brick. So it's definitely very, very portable. And it can be operated using a mobile device uh, like a cell phone or a tablet uh, or a laptop. It can do both targeted testing and non-targeted testing. It comes with a couple of different types of attachments. There is the, um, the vial attachment that um, allows you to measure liquid samples. And there's also a test strips attachment that allows you to perform measurements using a test strip. The way this instrument works is based on a technique called Raman spectroscopy. And for those of you who don't know what Raman spectroscopy is, um, so here's a quick overview. Um, when you shine light at a molecule, light will be scattered elastically, in which case it's called a Rayleigh scattering, or inelastically, in which case it is called Raman scattering. Raman scattering is a type of scattering where the energy of the scattered photons is different from the original energy of your light source. And the scattered energy can be higher or lower depending on the energy state of the molecule. The different chemical bonds in a molecule create a unique fingerprint Raman spectrum that helps you to identify what molecule is responsible for the scattering. As an optical technique, Raman is very high throughput and allows you to get a result within seconds. It also offers the ability for multiplex uh, detection, meaning that you can detect multiple analytes at the same time, provided, of course, that you are able to separate out the, the Raman peaks that are for the, the different molecules. Decades ago, Raman spectroscopy required bulky lasers and detectors, but with advances in sensor technology and optical components, Raman instruments are usually now fairly small that, so that they can really fit into the palm of your hand. So how do you detect adulteration with Raman? So edible oils, um, from different sources contain different ratios or different types of fatty acids. And this gives rise to variations in the Raman spectral signature. So if you were to um, say, look at a, the lauric acid, which is mainly found in coconut oils, um, and you compare it with, um, let's say, palmitic acid, which is found mainly in palm oils, you can see some slight differences in the spectrum, even though they might not be so obvious. But using a correlation algorithm, it is possible to show that uh, they have slight differences in, um, in the, the Raman signature. So taking advantage of this difference, you can implement a, a detection approach using the MISA instrument. First, of course, you would have to store a reference spectrum of the sample 
or, or, or analyte that you're interested in. And then for the samples that you're interested in, you do a measurement and then you do a comparison um, of the correlation and you ask the question, is the correlation between your, the sample that you just measured, is, is it higher or lower than a set threshold that you've set? And if it, the answer is yes, then you have a positive identification or you could configure it as a pass. And if it's no, then of course the sample fails uh, and it tells you that it's different. So for more advanced analysis, you can combine Raman with chemometrics. In this work, we have combined Raman data with PCA analysis to differentiate or, and identify different oil types. We were able to correctly identify different oils that we bought from grocery stores. Um, the squares in the, P, in, in the, um, the graph here shows that we were able to detect cor and correctly identify all the different types of oils that we purchased. The squares that are highlighted with a hashtag that is an a indication of a close match, but still uh, different enough that it doesn't uh, suffice for a pass. Uh, for more details of this um, application, you can refer to our white paper, which you can download from the Metro website. So Raman itself is a very weak effect. So unless you are, you are having bulk amount of materials, you usually cannot get a good Raman spectrum. So this means that if you want to detect trace levels of a contaminant in, for example, oils, you're not gonna be able to, detect, to, to do it using this method. To get from sort of non-targeted testing, um, like I've shown you to targeted testing, it was discovered that nanostructures, particularly gold and silver nanostructures, can greatly enhance the Raman scattering by billions of times if the molecule of interest is close enough to the surfaces of these nanostructures. Because this effect depends on a surface, it was named surface enhanced Raman, uh, Raman scattering or SIRS. This technique allows us to practically detect analytes in the PPM to PPV ranges. Because SIRS relies on the interaction of the molecule with a surface, it doesn't really work well if the analyte doesn't have functional groups that interact or sort of stick to the surface. Fortunately for us, a lot of contaminants like pesticides and artificial colorings do contain good functional groups with nitrogens and sulfurs that show strong interaction. So we're able to detect those fairly easily. And at Metrum, we offer a uh, variety of SERS materials that can perform this uh, SERS test. We specialize in uh, nanoparticle colloids, gold or silver, and we also have a test strip with printed nanomaterials that allows you to do the SERS testing. So as an example, um, we looked at trying to detect uh, fantion, which is one of the common organophosphate pesticides used to control olive fruit flies in olive groves. So the, the problem is of course that widespread Spraying of olive orchards can sometimes resolve in, result in olive oils that occasionally exceed the maximum allowed uh, limit for the pesticide. And the fact that you have a very complex 
matrix with olive oil and the presence of interference, this can usually make analysis of pesticide residues fairly difficult. So in this example, we spiked diphentyon uh, into extra virgin olive oil at very concentrations ranging from 0.5 microgram per mil to up to 100 microgram per mil. And the sample processing steps were um, involved dilution of the oil sample with cyclohexane followed by a extraction with acetonitrile. And we did a concentration step by evaporating the acetonitrile. Finally, we added the gold nanoparticles for the SERS measurement. Um, and on the right-hand side here, you see the, the detection of the different concentrations of fentyron in the oil, um, showing fairly beautiful SERS peaks from the fentyron. And I should stress that with the, the method that I've described, very little solvent was used for the sample preparation. So only about half a millimeter, uh, milliliter of the solvent was used. And the total sample preparation time from uh, doing all the extraction to the actual analysis took uh, about 15 minutes. We also tested uh, a different organophosphate, it's called a dimethod. Um, and in this case, we use our silver, uh, silver strips, test strips material with our MISA and the plot on the left-hand side shows the different concentrations um, that we were able to get with the SERS test. This is a slightly different um, application example. So the previous two examples were talking about, you know, looking at the final product. But what if you were able to detect the pesticides on the fruit itself, on the olive, before you convert them into oil? So in this example, we use the, the test strip as a swab. Uh, and basically, we try to swab the, the, the fruit and pick up the pesticide residue and, and detect it before it's been processed. And in this example, we use thyrum as the test analyte. Thyrum is a commonly used fungicide in many orchards to control fungal growth. And <clears throat> excuse me, on the left hand side, you see the characteristic peaks for um, thyrum. With this technique, you could also achieve some sort of semi quantitative analysis if you're careful enough. So what you try to do, of course, is to measure the peak intensities of um, the spectrum at different concentrations and use that to build a sort of calibration curve where you can sort of then, uh, depending on your sample measurement, able to correlate and, and determine the um, concentration of your sample. So to wrap up, um, I'll go over the features of our MISA um, platform. It's a portable Raman SERS instrument that is intended for lab and field usage. We have a fairly large library of common contaminants uh, that um, if found in oils and in other food items. But we also offer the user the capability to build their own libraries. We have a proprietary SERS algorithm on board which help to reduce the interference from food matrices so that you get a, a more accurate result. And the instrument 
uh, and the software has ability to generate reports and share data via Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, or cellular networks. And this last point is fairly important because that allows us to sort of integrate Raman with mobile communication. Uh, as I mentioned uh, in the beginning, the, the MISA can be operated through a, a mobile device. We can also take advantage of that mobile device to take pictures of the sample so that there's a record of where the, the sample, uh, what the sample looked like, and also where the sample was measured. And moving um, a step ahead, now that you have all this data, imagine if you have sort of multiple instruments at different locations, you can sort of pull data into a command center, which then allows you to have a, a, a sort of global or, or global or a countrywide view of the problem and allow you to correctly uh, implement responses to mitigate the problem. So this, is my summary um, of our uh, device. MISA is a low-cost mobile ramen platform that can help complement other uh, existing food testing technologies to combat edible oils contamination and adulteration. But really, the usage is uh, beyond just edible oils, but it's definitely applicable to a lot of other uh, food types as well. And I think my time is up. So uh, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, I'll be very happy to take any questions that you may have. Thank you, uh, Wei. That was a really interesting technology. And we, we did generate a number of questions here. So, so be ready. Uh, first question. Okay. What? Oh, I'm going to mess up this word. What excitation wavelength does MISA use, and how does this state relate to the fluorescent fluoros, fluorescence backgrounds that occurs in different organic or biological samples? So the MISA uses a 785 nanometer laser. Um, if it was just a, a purely Raman measurement, of course, the fluorescence can be an issue uh, for certain samples. For SERS measurements, the SERS actually, because you are using such low concentrations of um, materials, uh, and also the fact that uh, with SERS, you, are, you have some nanostructures that actually reduces the amount of fluorescence. So with SERS, the, the fluorescence, the technique, um, fluorescence is not such a big issue. Okay, great. Next question. There are a huge range of possible contaminants and adulterants that might be present in an oil. Is there any kind of screening test to give you a clue as to what might be worth looking for in more detail? Um, so I think this is the, the case where um, the MISA can work with other technologies in order to sort of solve the problem. Uh, the MISA is not a, a, a GC, right? because with GC, you could probably like uh, add your sample and, and run it and look at the peaks and try to be able to detect all the contaminants or pesticides, for example, that are in the sample. Uh, the, the MISA with, with SERS, you sometimes might need to have a, a sort of idea of what it is that you're looking for, even though we do have like a large library that you can compare the, the acquired spectrum against, but it does help to know, have a rough idea of what type of contaminant it is present in your sample so that you can select um, the appropriate, um, say sample preparation, approaches and also match to a um, appropriate library. Okay, next question. What is the measurement area 
Is there an issue with sample presentation heterogeneity caused by the dispersion of hot spots between colloidal gold or me metallic structures in the strip? Yeah, so the, the measurement area, um, so I, I guess it, um, the, the, the um, person is referring to is the size of uh, our, our substrate. Um, the strip, our test strips are about a, a centimeter square uh, in area. For the colloids, of course, it, it's, it's different. Uh, but I think it's well known that, that there's, uh, SIRS is well known for variability. Uh, with our instrument, we have a unique feature called raster uh, ORS, uh, where the, we are actually rastering, moving the laser over the whole sample. And so we are not looking at a single spot on the substrate surface, but we are scanning uh, a fairly large area over the surface to give a more averaged spectrum of uh, the sample. And that does help with uh, sort of random hotspots. All right, Thank thanks Wei. We do have a follow-up uh, to the heterogeneity question. What is the error for replicatable, for replicate measurements? So um, the typical, um, based on our testing, I think we can achieve within 20% of variability um, in our measurements using, also it depends on the type of material, right? So if you're, look, if you're talking about the colloids, it's more sensitive and it's more reproducible. The strips is, uh, have a little bit higher variability, uh, but it sort of compensates for that in, in terms of uh, um, ease of use. It's, it's a, a lot easier to use a test strip than to try and do a colloid measurement. Okay, and a follow-up to the area, what is the laser spot size itself? Or the, or the raster? Uh, the, so the laser spot, I believe, uh, I, I would have to look at my technical documentation. Uh, it's around 40 microns, but the raster pattern itself, because it's constantly moving uh, over the area, it's about a millimeter square. Okay. What about the uh, data? Um, does that get housed in the cloud or where does the data get uploaded to? So th the data can be stored on the, the, the device. So if, okay. if, it's, uh, if you're using a cell phone, it's stored on there. Uh, if you're using a laptop, of course, it's stored on the, on the laptop. But you can then share the data to uh, your secure database if you want, or you could send it to uh, a colleague so that they can uh, have that data as well. So it's, it becomes very portable once you, you do the acquisition. Okay. All right, there are no other questions for Wei. Thanks a lot, Wei, really appreciate your time. Very informative.